Boy, that's a great, I, I feel like I just got a lesson from you. Like just the fact that the way you were listening and, and trying to figure out where your sound is going to fit and how that's going to react to, you know, that. I actually it's, it's a great way to great way to listen and, and a great way to approach uh, any kind of brass playing, but obviously orchestral brass playing. Well, I accept I accept Mastercard. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, mine is tapped out, but we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> Leave that in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's it's also quite uh, quite wonderful what you said about Arnold Jacobs, and it must have been a kind of a great way to to approach it, you know, because you are you you did follow an icon and and like i said you have created a slot for yourself that is uh, a very formidable position in the world of uh, orchestral brass playing um, but what a great way to approach it is that nobody can be replaced and that you're starting your own time in the orchestra and you obviously approach it musically from uh, a great place in terms of ability but you also have humility i can tell the way you i know the way you play you can approach it with humility and with a lot of grace so that's a great thing one of the I think one of my best lessons that I had when I was first into Chicago was that Leonard Slacken came to guest conduct. Mm. And this is right after I had just left his orchestra gulp and <laughs> moved on to Chicago. And so I got together with Leonard in, in, in the conductor's room after a rehearsal or two and asked him what he was hearing, especially since he had regularly guest conducted Chicago and we'd come to St. Louis and that, and he gave me some, uh, some very good pointers. He, he said, one thing that always has, the, the Chicago tradition always, everyone talks about how Herseth would be the leader of how, of how the brass section works. He says, but really when, sh when, when you listen to the old Chicago recordings, it's really what was happening from the bottom. Mm -hmm. It was Jacobs. And a big part of Jacobs playing was the, was the front end, the, mm -hmm. the, the attacks. Not so much the follow through because there wasn't much because he didn't have that much air capacity, but especially the front end attacks. And he said in order to work in this hall, orchestra hall, which is a notoriously dead hall, mm -hmm. is to really put a lot of punch on the front end and that kind of will really help out the rest of the ensemble. And I went back on stage and it actually made a lot of sense. And I listened to some of the old recordings of of Chicago with that with that view in mind, especially the old uh, uh, trombone ensemble, trombone tuba ensemble that came out, I think, in the late 60s, early yeah, 70s, right. something like that. And by golly, that's exactly the way Jacobs would play mm. and, and how the trombone section works. So, so in, in some ways, the, the brass section was good as an ensemble because you had so many players who were willing to be team players. And when you had Herseth on the top pulling, pulling from the top and you had Jacobs on the bottom, bottom pushing, it just kind of made this whole thing happen. Wow. I, and also that, in the, particularly happening in Orchestra Hall, the notoriously dead hall, and then all of a sudden every, they, they take all the trucks and move everything down to Champaign-Urbana and record a Mahler Symphony in, uh, in Cranert Center, mm -hmm. the Cranert Center, which is a very, very live hall, and all of a sudden you've just unleashed all the horses because here's this great resonant hall and, and, and you have this, th this orchestra that's been in this dead hall you know, doing this stuff, and then you let them out into the wild, wide open spaces, and you get these Mahler recordings that come out, and the brass section is just going nuts, and as one of my friends says in the orchestra, it just rendered the, the string section to tape hiss. I mean, there's <laughs> nothing. It's just, it's just unbelievable. And so these great recordings come out out of Champaign-Urbana from, from the Chicago Symphony, and, and it, all of a sudden it just kind of takes on a life of its own, and then finally, um, Sir George managed to take the, the orchestra to, uh, to Europe in the, in the, in the mid-70s, 1973 or something like that. And all of a sudden, the rest of the world started to realize, hey, there's something going on back there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so. Wow, that's uh, great information, Gene. I mean, that's uh, really, I, I know that hall in, uh, in Champaign-Urbana, and uh, absolutely right, it's a very, uh, very live hall, to say the least, but that's a great... Uh, Great information. Um, you know, this kind of leads me nicely into you talking about Leonard Slack, and um, I just wanted to play a little name association with you, um, with some conductors that you have worked with uh, over the years. Um, and if you don't mind, maybe just, um, yeah, we could just talk maybe a couple of thoughts about each one. 
um, kind of just quick ideas. And uh, each one of these gentlemen are obviously virtuosic musicians. So uh, just kind of interested in your take, and, and you uh, have a, a very personal association with all of them. Um, but anyway, let's start off with, uh, with Zubin Mehta. Zubin Mehta, he gave me my first job. How can I fault him? <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he took a lot of chances. He, I was green as, I, I was green as grass. There was no reason for him to take me. He could have had <clears throat> any number of more experienced players uh, for the Israel Philharmonic, but he, he took me on a dare. No, well, it may have been a dare. I mean, I don't know what he does in his private life, but no, he, he, he took a chance. And he trusted uh, the people who he knew, Roger Bobo and Tommy Johnson and Jeff Reynolds and, and his brass associates there in Los Angeles. And uh, he took a chance on me. And I will always, always feel grateful for his, his, his trust in that, yeah. in, that, in that judgment. Yeah, good stuff. Well, he clearly heard something special that's, uh, that everybody else has heard now. Um, Sir George Schulte. He gave me my Chicago job. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well, Sir George was a... Was a he was a great musician who had very, very definitive ideas of how he liked certain things to be done. And the fascinating thing about that was that everyone in the orchestra seemed to know what that was, even if what his hand directions, his conducting, which some would say is maybe not the, maybe a bit spasmodic, uh, something. I mean, his conducting technique was not the, not the most graceful, but in spite of whatever his uh, his baton was doing, people knew what he wanted, what his definitive idea of how he wanted something to be done. It caused people, because of that, um, maybe I hate to say questionable baton technique. It's no, nah, it's I mean it just it, it worked well enough, but it caused people to listen like crazy, mm. and I think that was one of the secrets of. Of, of Sir George because he, he managed to get the orchestra to listen to one another and to be unified in whatever his ideas, in spite of whatever, wh whatever um, um, uh, visual flight mm -hmm. rules were going on at the mm -hmm. time. Yeah, interesting, very interesting. Um, this next gentleman from an outsider uh, looking at it, uh, I, it always struck me as just an unbelievably consummate virtuosic musician, um, Daniel Barenboim. Oh yeah. Well, uh, uh, Maestro Barenboim was um, uh, a very, very, very talented guy who had um, uh, had so much natural ability. I have no idea how he managed to um, understand just mortals you know, who had to, you know, play with music and had. And he just—it was just such a natural thing for him, and he was extremely. Um, inventive with how he would interpret music and we would go from night to night with completely different interpretations of the same piece and I remember one person who actually dared him to change the end of Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony which which ends bum, bum, ba, 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 bum. and and um, it was I think it was Clevenger who dared him to, to slow the last three notes without a rehearsal and he, and he changed it every single night. There was no point in even having a rehearsal with the guy <laughs> because he would change it. It was almost like he was, he was, he was playing with a cat. Mm. You know, he was just, it wasn't that he was bored, but he was just having fun. And um, so you always had to be on the edge of your seat with, with Baron Boyman. In fact, uh, a lot of, I remember one time we were coming home from a tour and the plane was coming into O'Hare Airport and the plane landed and it was uh, one of our former oboe players in the orchestra who says, I think on the whole tour, that was the only time the orchestra was together, when the plane landed. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, <laughs> quite interesting. Um, well, this next gentleman, I had, we've talked about him already a, a little bit, but uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him when I was on a Rolling Stones tour, and we were in Tokyo, and uh, St. Louis Symphony uh, was in Tokyo, and uh, I got to spend a little bit of time with him. But anyway, Leonard Slatkin, I'd be interested in a little more of your thoughts about him. Yeah, well... I was uh, I was very happy to really win that audition in St. Louis, and uh, Leonard clearly heard some things uh, from me that he wanted to take a chance on because uh, there were some other people who were who were playing regularly with him at the time before they managed to pick a permanent uh, a permanent player. So he took a chance on me, and uh, we had. 
We had a good time. He managed to make a good chemistry with the orchestra. He was a great child psychologist. He knew how to get the best things out of different people in the orchestra. Mm. And uh, uh, I think that's one of the great things about uh, the really great conductors. They, they really know how to get the best types of things out of, out of certain players, out of certain sections. And Leonard could do that. He really put together um, a lot of great American music. I don't know if any of it will last, but as far as interpretation is concerned, he certainly put together um, um, a, a lot of good things. That chemistry in St. Louis was was pretty amazing. It, sometimes it doesn't work, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Slacken coming to Chicago doesn't have the same type of chemistry as Slacken did with St. Louis, just like uh, Esa Pekasalan and coming to the Chicago Symphony doesn't have the same chemistry as it did when Esa Pekasalan was in L.A. It just depends on the different orchestras. Mm -hmm. but. But I, I, uh, I really liked uh, wor working with Leonard. He was Leonard Slack. He always insisted by calling him by his first name, which mm. was, was a little disconcerting. You know, I mean, <laughs> conductors aren't even mortal. You don't even yeah. see them eat. Yeah, right. You know? <laughs> um, well, that's great stuff. Um, and then we'll finish up with uh, the current conductor of CSO, Ricardo Muti. Yeah, he's, he's pretty amazing. He's a... Uh, I don't think the orchestra ever thought we would have someone as good as that. And I know Charlie um, Charlie Vernon was pushing for for uh, for Maestro Muti for a long time, and I read all the press reports and th thought some of them to be accurate before he actually came to town that he was a tyrant, an egomaniac, and all this. I don't know. I never saw any of that mm. since he's come to town. And he's he's always been extremely positive. Occasionally he gets moody, but you know who doesn't. But I tell you, he he he's brought brought this orchestra along in a really really good way, and uh, I feel uh, I feel really fortunate to be able to spend spend this this time with him and to learn a whole nother repertoire because you know you can only live so long on goulash, you know, Eastern <laughs> European Russian stuff, and all of a sudden now go to rehearsal and I'm surprised there aren't more people overweight in the orchestra because you know he starts talking and. Man, you feel, I just feel like having a big plate of spaghetti after every <laughs> rehearsal, after every performance. You know, I just feel like we're all going to, you know, have too much macaroni by the end of the season or something. So.